I'm giving this talk on behalf of, of Jacob Schreiber. Jacob is a PhD student at the University of Washington in computer science. Jacob, unfortunately, he just started a internship at Tesla. That's not the unfortunate part. The unfortunate part is that he couldn't get off uh, to give this talk. So I'm giving it on his behalf. Um, he is the primary author of the tool I'm going to be telling you about. So I'll do my best to answer your questions. But if you have any uh, other questions, his contact information is on this slide. Uh, he says, please feel free to contact him uh, using any of these uh, methods of social media. In particular, if you have questions that uh, I can't answer, I'll encourage you to tweet them at him. And I believe he is online during this talk. So hopefully, he'll tweet back right away. And then uh, you, once you get the answer, raise your hand and then tell everyone what the answer was. So we can do kind of a remote uh, question and answer. <clears throat> uh, my name is Max Lebrecht. I am currently a postdoc in, uh, at the University of Washington. I'm affiliated with both the genome sciences and the computer science department. I'm in the same research group as Jacob. We both work on computational biology. I'll be starting as an assistant professor at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, BC uh, at the end of the month. Uh, if you're interested in, uh, there won't be anything about pomegranate on this website, but I have my website there if you're interested in reading about my research. <clears throat> uh, so uh, please, in this talk, feel free to ask me questions anytime. Uh, and like I said, uh, if there are questions that I can't answer, feel free to uh, email or tweet at Jacob. This talk is about pomegranate, which is a Python toolkit for fast and flexible probabilistic modeling in Python. So uh, this talk is accompanied by a Jupyter Notebook tutorial. Um, so the link here will take you to a Jupyter Notebook that you can download. If, you, uh, you know, if you're here and you're remotely interested in this, I think actually the notebook is probably an even better way to understand this than me talking at you. So I encourage you very strongly to go to this link and download the notebook and just open it on your computer and start playing with the tools because that's a really nice way to just get a sandbox. You can sort of uh, plug in arguments to the various functions I'll be telling you about uh, and see what happens. Um, so uh, that link is there for anyone who hasn't gotten a chance to see it yet. I'll also, the link is going to be on the next couple of slides just so that people have time to, to type it in. <clears throat> okay. Uh, pomegranate is a tool for probabilistic modeling. So what do I mean by that? Um, just very generally, uh, probabilistic modeling is any case where you have some data uh, that's generated from some uncertain process. Um, so those uh, data values, they could be continuous real numbers. They could be discrete uh, binary yes, no, uh, discrete uh, categorical variables. Uh, but in general, any time you have uh, information that's generated in an uncertain way, it's uh, usually a very effective, uh, it's very effective to apply probabilistic modeling uh, to that data. <clears throat> um, probabilistic, model lends us, probabilistic modeling lends itself well to a package because there are sort of a core set of tasks that you want to perform uh, related to probabilistic modeling. Um, so very generally, uh, if you have some probability distribution, um, you might want to sample uh, data from that distribution. If you have some data and you want to learn what uh, distribution generated that data, you can uh, do that in a probabilistic framework. Or in, from kind of a uh, prediction or machine learning perspective, you might want to predict which of a number of distributions generate a particular data example. And I'm going to be going a lot uh, more detail on this soon. Um, so this is the motivation for why uh, pomegranate exists as a toolkit to solve um, sort of this, this category of tasks. So supposing that uh, you're interested in probabilistic modeling, uh, probabilistic modeling is a very large um, uh, field. Uh, there are many uh, problems associated with it. Uh, and there are lots of tools uh, that solve probabilistic modeling related tasks. So in what cases should you use pomegranate for your problem? Um, so first thing, I think you can sort of divide your, your task into a continuum from very simple to very complex. So on the very simple side, you might have uh, just uh, you know, very simple prediction tasks like logistic regression. You could just want to sample from a Gaussian distribution. Uh, and maybe you don't care about speed. 
because you just this is just you have to do it once, no big deal. Um, for those types of things, the very simple uh, problems are available in toolkits that you're probably already using, like SciPy or Scikit-Learn. Um, so if that's all you're trying to do, you don't need pomegranate. Uh, pomegranate can certainly solve these problems, uh, and probably a little bit faster than uh, these tools. But again, if speed isn't important, don't bother with pomegranate. Just just use the tools you're already using. On the other side. Uh, the most cutting edge of statistics research um, usually will be implemented in uh, custom packages that you can usually access using R or in some standalone, standalone uh, command line tool. Um, unfortunately, uh, these days, uh, most statistics research, the first place it gets implemented is still in R. That's too bad for us who like to use Python. Um, so, you know, if you're trying to use uh, that sort of cutting edge, you'll have to go to uh, these special tools. So again, that may be cases where you have uh, distributions that aren't available in Pomegranate or some very specific inference problem uh, that's related to your specific application that needs to be really, really fast. Okay, but for any, anywhere in between, uh, I, I, I argue that Pomegranate uh, is a pretty good uh, solution. <clears throat> um, so the advantages of Pomegranate uh, it supports a lot of different distributions. I'll be telling you about all the distributions. Uh, those are probability distributions. All the different distributions that it supports today. Uh, I'll argue, and I hope uh, this talk will convince you, that it's pretty intuitive to use, and it's very flexible. Um, it's very easy to uh, uh, mix and match uh, distributions to your purposes. Um, and I'll be showing you some cases uh, about how uh, it's very fast. OK, so Pomegranate is great for uh, these cases where you'd like to use Python. You have a problem uh, that's sophisticated enough that you can't use these uh, very widely used tools, uh, but you, know, you don't need this, uh, this stuff that you have to leave, R for, or leave Python for, I'm sorry. <clears throat> OK, so then some other tasks. It's helpful to know, I think, if you're interested uh, in knowing when to use a particular tool, when you shouldn't use that tool. Um, so I'm going to uh, show you a couple of tools that there's a couple of cases where Pomegranate does not apply. Uh, and these are also uh, Python packages that you may or may not be familiar with uh, that are probably useful in conjunction to Pomegranate. Um, OK, so the first one is scientific computing. Uh, Pomegranate uh, uh, utilizes uh, NumPy and SciPy a lot. And certainly, if you're involved, if you're doing anything with data, you probably need to use uh, NumPy and SciPy. Um, if you're doing supervised learning that, that can't be considered in a probabilistic uh, sense, I'm not going to really talk about what that means, but, but for getting simple support vector machines and neural networks don't really fit into this probabilistic framework so well. I'm going to show you a couple of cases of supervised learning that do fit into the probabilistic framework. Uh, but for these uh, examples, you'll probably have to use a different toolkit. Uh, for example, scikit-learn uh, is really lots about machine learning and particular, in particular supervised learning. Uh, if you want to visualize any of these models, Pomegranate doesn't do any visualization itself. Uh, you'll have to use something like Matplotlib. Uh, and then maybe one of the uh, toolkits that also, that in Python is most powerful for probabilistic model, modeling is this toolkit called PyMC3. Um, I don't know. Uh, a lot about PyMC3. Jacob could tell you more about the differences. Uh, but if you're interested in probabilistic modeling, I think you want to check out both Pomegranate and PyMC3. Um, PyMC3, I think, is uh, much more from the sort of Bayesian philosophy of probabilistic modeling. <clears throat> OK, so the, the structure of this talk is I'm just going to give you a pretty quick overview of sort of the philosophy behind Pomegranate and uh, what its various features are. And then I'm going to go into depth on some of its more, uh, more complex and more powerful features uh, in this section here. And then at the end, uh, I want to show you how we can sort of leverage all of the power of Pomegranate uh, to do something you probably would have a really hard time doing with uh, most other toolkits. Um, again, uh, if there are any questions, please uh, stop me. Um, these slides are not online. There are similar slides. The question is, uh, are the slides online? Um, there's, the slides that these were based off of are also on that GitHub repository um, that you can find from this link here. Sorry, I should have put the slides online before this talk. Uh, they're, they're almost the same slides, though. These are just a couple of changes. Any more questions? <coughs> 
OK, uh, so like I said at the beginning, there are a common set of tasks you might want to perform no matter what probability distribution you're interested in. So, so I said before, you might want to sample, you might want to predict. Uh, here is a common API that Pomegranate implements for all of its models. OK, first thing is if you have a probability distribution, you can uh, predict the probability of a particular data example. Um, you can, uh, and that's with the, either the model.probability. I'm getting some feedback. Let me try to fix this. <clears throat> OK, you can uh, predict the probability, or you can uh, calculate the probability of a given data example. You can sample values from a model. So this will, uh, you take the model, you, you run sample on it, and it'll produce an x. That's uh, the same x that you would put in here. You can take uh, a model with unknown parameters and use a bunch of data, that's this x, to fit uh, its parameters. Uh, and there are some uh, common uh, parameters you can take with fitting. For example, you can put a weight on each, excuse me, you can put a weight on each data example. <clears throat> I'll tell you a little bit uh, soon about these idea of uh, uh, summaries and the idea of a summary statistic. Um, and then uh, you can also, for a subset of methods, you can, if it's a, um, a mixture distribution or a uh, classifier model, I'll tell you more about that in a second, you can predict uh, which distribution a particular value came from. You can predict the probability. This has the same uh, framework if you're familiar with scikit-learn. Uh, Scikit-learn will either predict the class or predict the probability of different classes. Pomegranate will do the same thing. This is the same thing with log. Uh, and then I'll tell you, uh, well, so uh, Pomegranate also has this idea of the difference between fit and from samples. So these two methods are similar in the sense that they, uh, they both take some, a collection of data and produce as output a model with, with fit parameters. <clears throat> uh, the difference between the two is that fit is designed for models where you have a pretty specific uh, idea of what you're looking for. For example, um, in a mixture of Gaussian distributions, you might already know how many uh, Gaussian components you want to fit. Uh, then you do fit. With the from samples, it's intended to be uh, much you're imposing much less structure on the problem. Uh, for example, in the uh, Gaussian case, I believe it, you don't have to tell it how many components you want. Um, you'll have to look at the, the documentation uh, for more, for each, for each model exactly what the difference between fit uh, and, and from samples is. <clears throat> uh, but that's just the general philosophy difference between the two. OK, so there are. Uh, six general categories of models that Pomegranate supports, and I'm going to be going through all of these. Um, the first is just basic probability distributions, things like a uh, Gaussian distribution, a uniform distribution. Uh, the second is uh, general mixture models. So Pomegranate lets you take uh, any distributions you want and uh, produce a mixture of those together. I'll be telling you again about each of these together. A uh, Markov chain. Um, which is a way of modeling sequences with uh, probability distributions. Hidden Markov models uh, are the uh, same thing. Uh, Bayes classifiers, which is a way of performing supervised learning using uh, in a, a probabilistic framework, and then Bayesian networks. Um, there are also uh, two helper models uh, uh, in Pomegranate. These probably uh, are only useful you know, as uh, because they support these other uh, models, but they but they are implemented, uh, and so that's uh, k-means plus plus. Uh, k-means is a clustering algorithm. Uh, uh, k-means bar bar. That's um, scalable k-means is uh, sort of a variant of that. It's good for I believe uh, parallel architectures, um, and then factor graphs uh, are used in Bayesian networks. Okay, so like I said, I'm going to just uh, touch on each of these. Uh, categories of models uh, in turn. OK, so here is a list of, I think, most of the 
uh, base distributions that pomegranate supports. Uh, and I've colored in red the ones that are commonly used. Uh, so, uh, for example, the uh, uniform distribution, that's just um, a distribution uh, that's flat. Uh, so no difference between the different uh, values that it could take. A normal distribution, also called a Gaussian distribution. Um, exponential distribution, uh, these are probably uh, you know, distributions that you would have heard of in your you know, basic uh, uh, probability course. Um, so what pomegranate can do is it can, uh, you can create one of these distributions, you can sample from it using that API that I told you about, just model.sample. You, uh, uh, you can take a distribution and you can create it from known values. Um, so in this case, we have, we'd like to make a normal distribution. So a normal distribution, that's just a, a bell-shaped Gaussian distribution. Um, it has two parameters, mu and sigma, the mean and the uh, uh, standard deviation. So you take this normal distribution function defined in pomegranate, you pass in the mu and the sigma, and you get A, which is uh, a pomegranate model. And then you can run uh, any of those um, uh, any of those functions that I told you about earlier, you can do sample on it, uh, you can do predict on it, for example. Um, so here I'm just showing a couple just very simple examples. Here's a case where we um, uh, made a couple of different uh, Gaussian distributions using pomegranate. Okay, and then you can also learn the uh, the parameters of a probability distribution using pomegranate. So in this case, we've used NumPy to make a bunch of random variables. Um, you could also do this in pomegranate, of course. Um, so the, how this function works is it's, you pass in the mean and the variance, so it's uh, values with mean zero, standard deviation one, and we want 100 of these. Uh, that's this data here at the bottom, so each dot is one of our data points, and the horizontal axis is the value of that data point. Uh, and that's X is just that big list of 100 values. Then we can use pomegranate. We take the normal distribution class and we call from samples for, on it uh, and we give it our data X. And what pomegranate will learn is this normal distribution here. Uh, and you can see that it has a, approximately a mean of zero, which is how we generate the data in the first place. So it looks like it's doing okay. One of the, I think, the most powerful features of pomegranate is that it can handle this idea of model stacking. So that's where you take a one type of model and use it as a submodel in some wrapper model. Okay, so what, is, what does that mean? Uh, so the, it's the most simple in the case of a mixture model. Um, so uh, what I'm showing you here in this uh, figure is on the horizontal axis I have, or on both axes I have the different, uh, the different classes of models in pomegranate. So again, distributions, base classifiers, classifiers, markup chains, and so on. And then here is just the acronym for the same thing. So what a mixture distribution is, uh, is just a distribution uh, where you imagine that you have some probability of pulling from one distribution, some probability of pulling for a different distribution. So each time you want to generate a data example, first you flip a coin to decide which distribution uh, you're going to sample from, and then you sample from that distribution as you would normally, and then you output uh, that value. Um, so mixture distributions come up in all sorts of cases. I'm going to show you a bunch of examples uh, later, but the interesting thing about pomegranate is you can take any distribution that pomegranate implements, and you can use that as one of the components of a mixture distribution. So what I'm showing you here is there's a blue square anytime that kind of uh, input of one model into another model is implemented. So in this case, you can see that it's implemented that distributions can be used as input to uh, GMMs, meaning general mixture models. And you can see uh, a bunch of other cases too. So ge a mixture models can be uh, kind of recursively input into each other. And then hidden Markov models can be input as uh, a component of mixture models as well. Uh, these light blue squares are features that are in development. So I think these will be ready pretty soon. Uh, so just 
if this is something you're interested in, get uh, check out a um, you know watch for watch for coming patches to pomegranate. So we can fill in this this table and look for all the different uh, places where uh, these things are implemented. So a hidden Markov model. Uh, what it means for a hidden Markov model to have a submodel is that that uh, submodel is the emission distribution of the hidden Markov model. Um, so like I said, a hidden Markov model is a probability distribution over sequences. So what a hidden Markov model implements is that at every position, you have some uh, distribution over what value could be output at that sequence. Um, and you can see uh, hidden Markov models, uh, you can put it as input any distribution as the emission distribution, and even any mixture model as the emission distribution. Uh, and again, Bayes nets, uh, you can implement, you can uh, use as emission distribution soon. So here's that full table. Um, so you can see that all models can have uh, distrib just the base distributions as their submodel. Um, Bayes classifiers are sort of a different type from everything else here because a Bayes classifier isn't a probability distribution itself. It's a, it's kind of a uh, supervised learning task. So it doesn't even make sense for, for Bayes classifiers to be put as input into something else. So that's why this row is empty. Uh, and we can just go through. So um, uh, Bayes classifiers can have anything as input. Uh, and then I told you about these two uh, columns uh, as well. And you can see that soon it's coming that Markov chains can have uh, Markov chains as input as well. OK, and this is, uh, like I said, this is one of the most exciting features of Pomegranate, specifically because uh, this feature of model stacking, as far as uh, we can tell, isn't really available anywhere else. Um, so what I'm showing here is uh, cases where, uh, so this this is the, the the squares in this plot are just a subset of the squares in the previous plot. And these are places where, as far as we know, no other widely used package implements that particular type of uh, model stacking. Um, uh, so the red is places, or uh, yeah, the, so the dark red is places that Pomegranate implements that, as far as we can tell, no one else does. The, the orange is places where there are some other implementations, but they're far less fully featured than exists in Pomegranate. Um, so I think this is one of the, the biggest cases uh, for using Pomegranate is this fact that uh, whatever type of distribution you might be interested in, you can kind of mix and match. You can plug one distribution into another. Uh, and it means that uh, almost any problem that you might be interested in, it's probably solved by some uh, stacking of one model into another. I'll show you a couple of examples of how we can use that uh, soon. OK, another great thing about Pomegranate is that it's very fast. Um, so here, I'm just showing you a really simple example where we are uh, computing the mean and standard deviation of a bunch of data. So here, we create some data using NumPy. And then we, um, we compute the mean and standard deviation using NumPy, using this time it uh, function. And we do the same thing using pomegranate. Excuse me. Uh, and you see the output is down here. Uh, you see. NumPy took about uh, 45 microseconds per loop. Pomegranate took about 20 microseconds. Uh, the reason for this is just that um, NumPy is trying to be very general. It doesn't, there's no way to tell it that when you're going through a bunch of data, you want to be computing both the mean and the standard deviation at the same time. So basically, it's traveling through the data twice. Uh, and that's why it's about twice, twice the running time. Uh, whereas Pomegranate, uh, I'll, I'll tell you why it, um, it can do it with just one data pass uh, coming up. It's based on this idea of summary statistics. Um, OK, so that was a very simple example. That just took a couple microseconds. Let's do a slightly more intense uh, example. So here, again, we have a bunch of data. We want to compute. Um, oh, and this is, uh, this is 10 uh, data from a 10-dimensional uh, multivariate Gaussian. Um, and we, we want to compute both the mean and the covariance matrix. Uh, and it looks like, uh, again, pomegranate is a bit faster. Um, OK, uh, so why, why is it that pomegranate is faster? Uh, so the reason pomegranate is so fast is it uses this, uh, this library called BLAS. I don't actually know what BLAS stands for, but it's a, it's a linear algebra uh, 
toolkit. It's written, I believe, originally in Fortran, um, and it's sort of hyper-optimized. Um, so a pomegranate uses BLAST, but NumPy also uses BLAST. So that's not where the running time uh, is coming from. The reason pomegranate gets to be faster is that it's a more specific toolkit than NumPy. So what happens in NumPy is it, it ends up, uh, NumPy ends up going back and forth between uh, Python and, and uh, Fortran, but really uh, it's machine code uh, all the time, which just slows things down, uh, whereas pomegranate uh, doesn't have to do that uh, because it can use these top level calls to BLAST. So just one, one call into BLAST uh, and not these, these repeated calls uh, in and out. Um, okay, another thing, uh, if you're interested in running time that Pomegranate does, um, is it newly supports uh, GPU, uh, you, can, you can use a GPU to run uh, Pomegranate. Um, so you don't need a GPU. Uh, the, everything in Pomegranate will run without it, uh, but if you have one uh, available, Pomegranate will use it. Um, and it's through this package called CUPY. Um, and then you can see the running time of some different, uh, some different tasks using the, the GPU versus not. So you can see this, uh, this, this bar is the no GPU bar and the right is the GPU bar. And you can see, of course, uh, uh, GPUs uh, offer a lot of power, especially for tasks that are paralyzable. Um, and this turns out to be a task that is paralyzable, and the GPU is a lot faster. Um, uh, and of course, this is a case with lots of examples. If you have a small uh, amount of data, it does, it's not going to matter whether you use a GPU or no data, or a GPU or no GPU. <clears throat> okay, so I was telling you about how Pomegranate lets you compute these statistics, like the mean and the variance, with just one pass of the data. So how does it do this? And it uses this idea of sufficient statistics. So a sufficient statistic is a statistics, uh, a concept from the field of statistics, which says that if you have a bunch of data, you can, uh, in many cases, uh, compute a small number of sufficient statistics. Uh, that's the name of these numbers. Numbers called sufficient statistics that will tell you all you need to know about that uh, about that data as it pertains to a particular probability distribution. So let's use as our example the a normal distribution. It turns out if you have a ton of data, and it actually doesn't matter how much data, you can summarize everything you need for a normal distribution using three numbers. The uh, number of data points, or if it's weighted, just the sum of the weights. Uh, so again, if all the weights were one, then this would just be the number of data points. The, the sum of all the values in your data sets, again, you can wait or not wait, and the sum of the squares. Uh, and, I, and I'm showing you on the right how you compute the mean and the, the variance using just these three quantities. So you can see in the case of the mean, you take this number, that's number number two, uh, or I should say sufficient statistic number two, you divide statistic number two divided by statistic number one. To compute the variance, you take uh, sufficient statistic number three divided by uh, uh, number one minus number two squared divided by number one squared. Um, so it turns out that, that these equations compute successfully the mean and the variance, and again, you only need these numbers. So that's how Pomegranate got that speed up, is that in its first pass through the data, it was just computing these three sufficient statistics, and then ever after, it never had to look at the data again. It can just reference these statistics. Now, a really valuable thing about sufficient statistics is that uh, they help you support parallelization. <clears throat> so, uh, it turns out that those three statistics, in the case of a normal distribution, are additive, meaning you can take, you can compute the sufficient statistics on one set of data, you can compute it on another set of data, and then if you want to know what the statistics are for the full set of data, you just add each uh, pair of statistics. So uh, here's an example of uh, us doing that. So we are trying to uh, fit our model from a bunch of data. 
Uh, maybe this is like a ton of data. In this case, I think it's 5,000 data points. You could just fit it on the whole data set, uh, but that you could only do on one core, and so that one core would have to go through all of the data at once. But equivalently, you can use this function that Pomegranate implements called summarize. So what summarize does is it goes through the uh, data set and computes that the sufficient statistics on the data you give it. So in this case, we could take five threads uh, running on five different cores, compute the sufficient statistics on each, on a one fifth of the data in each case, and then run this uh, function from summaries on uh, all those statistics. Question. Do you have access to each of the calls previously, or does it override just for you as it as I believe this isn't real code. Um, I believe this is um, this is just some some code that we threw up. So so I think what this does is outputs the statistics, and then you uh, you produce and then you give it the statistics here. I, in, it should be that in the uh, in the uh, Jupyter notebook, there should be a case where you actually go through the whole thing and compare the running time. So if you want to know how to do this for real, I think it was just too much code to put on a slide. So if you want to know how to do this for real, uh, check out the notebook. Does that answer your question? Any more questions? <clears throat> yeah? Did you try if the mean like is a big? Like 1,000, the variance is like, uh, well, it's like very small. Mm -hmm. And you have a, a billion data summer size. How accurate is your computation? You're worried about it. So the question is, if you have a really large mean and a really small variance, how accurate is the computation? So your question is about numerical precision, I'm guessing? Yeah. I don't know the answer to that. Um, so Right. Um, that, I can see how that would be a problem. Uh, two, two solutions to that. One is just to change your, your floating point precision, of course. Uh, and two, of course, would be to change how you're doing the computation. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, tweet Jacob. I'm guessing he's done that experiment at some point, and he can probably point you to the results. Um, but I don't know the answer to that. More questions? Yeah. Um, OK. Uh, I'm going to go back a couple slides. Okay, here's the URL. It's down at the bottom here. Let's actually let's go all the way over here. Yeah, this one. Uh, here's here's the notebook. Um, like I said, uh, all of the results I'm showing you are uh, computed on this notebook. So you can just download the notebook, and then any result I'm showing you, you can just find the, the part of the notebook that implements that result, and you can just play with it. You could try, again, changing the mean to be really big and the variance to be really small and seeing what happens. Uh, you can just, anything you want to play with is here. I think this, like I said, I think this is one of the best ways to sort of get to know a toolkit. The whole repository? The whole repository? Oh yeah, that, that's another thing you can do. Is here's the uh, here's Jacob's GitHub, which has Pomegranate. You can always also just clone the whole thing. Any more questions? I'm gonna keep this up so people can see the URL. Okay. Yes, I'll do my best to do that. I don't know anything about the notebook. Uh, the question was, uh, what, it's, is it a Python 2 notebook? The answer is yes, it is Python 2. The only, I think, Python 3 compatibility issue, it sounds like, is that there uh, needs to have parentheses around the print statements. So you just put in those parentheses, it'll work. Question. And one more thing, around the map, put uh, list. Put map. Around the map, put list. Around the map function, yeah. So why did you that I believe, so the question is, what happens if your distribution does not have sufficient statistics? Uh, I'm not, I believe all of Pomegranate's distributions do have sufficient statistics. An another thing you can do is you can just store the whole data set as sort of a, 
you know, if you need to implement some distribution that doesn't support them, of course that has a big memory implication. Uh, and of course a running time implication because every time you have to go through all the data. Uh, but it doesn't, it's not strictly excluded from this kind of framework. Any more questions? Okay. Um, here's, here's sort of a, a picture for what I was saying is uh, to do parallelization, you can take your whole data set, you can split it into chunks, uh, use one core each to uh, compute the summaries on those chunks, and then add the, the sufficient, sufficient statistics together, and then compute your parameters on those st statistics. Okay, um, another uh, feature of Yes, another question. The question is, is pomegranate doing threading on its own? I don't know the answer to that question. <clears throat> um, okay. Uh, another feature of pomegranate is semi-supervised learning. Uh, so so uh, in, in semi-supervised learning, uh, you're trying to perform a supervised learning task, meaning uh, distinguish some class of examples from some, from some other class. So for, for example, those could be spam emails. You're trying to figure out uh, what emails are spam and what emails are not spam based on the context of that email. Um, in a semi-supervised problem, you have uh, both labeled data, that's these color points, and unlike a strict supervised problem, you also have a bunch of unlabeled data. Um, that, the, that's those gray points here. Uh, so in a semi-supervised case, uh, so in semi-supervised learning, what we do is we fit a probability distribution over each class, so a probability distribution over red and purple. Then we uh, assign all the unlabeled data to one of those two classes uh, based on whether or not it, uh, uh, but based on those distributions, then we use that data as labeled data uh, and fit new distributions and then go back and forth uh, fitting on the unlabeled data uh, and uh, updating our distributions. And actually there are teal points here. I don't think this is showing up on the projector, uh, but there's a bunch of teal, teal points down here. Um, unfortunately you can't see them. So, um, so why, why use semi-supervised learning? So in the left case, I'm showing you what happens when we perform uh, supervised learning. Uh, and you can see, and what I'm showing you here is these black lines are the decision boundaries uh, where the classifier draws lines between uh, different classes. So in this case, the, any point that's in this little sliver here, it will assign as red. Every point in this like sort of V-shaped thing here, it's gonna assign as purple, and then everything down here is gonna assign as teal. Um, this is not super satisfying because these decision boundaries look kind of unrealistic. Like it's, I mean, it's, uh, it's of course it's going to be very problem dependent, uh, you know, how you interpret these, but it's weird for a class to have this like sort of uh, sliver shape. So in a semi-supervised case, you can think of it kind of as regularization using the unlabeled data. <coughs> so uh, what this uh, procedure requires is that all the data, uh, all, that those decision boundaries should respect the shape of the underlying data pretty well. So what the, in the unsupervised, uh, sorry, the summer supervised method is seeing is that there's this chunk of data and we don't have very many labeled examples in it, but it's a pretty good guess that all of these come from the same class and they seem to be, uh, they seem to have this uh, shape a probability distribution. So the semi-supervised learner is uh, assigning, excuse me, this decision boundary uh, that sort of respects the density of the data. Um, so you, you see lots of cases uh, very often, for example, in image and text analysis where semi-supervised analysis uh, performs much better than uh, supervised um, because it really leverages uh, sort of the distribution of the underlying data. Um, semi-supervised, analysis makes a lot of sense in this probabilistic uh, framework. So that's right why it's really well suited to something like pomegranate. <clears throat> okay, a couple more uh, analyses of uh, running time. Uh, so 
Uh, here, what we're doing is we're uh, calculating the running time of uh, uh, fitting multivariate Gaussian distributions. So, uh, so here we're generating some data. Uh, so here's, here's where we generate the data. We have two, um, uh, two ways of, of computing the probability of this data, either using uh, SciPy, which, which can produce, compute the probability distribution according to a multivariate Gaussian, and using pomegranate. Um, and you can see uh, pomegranate is doing uh, about half the running time. Uh, you can see uh, pomegranate uh, takes 800 milliseconds. Uh, SciPy takes double that, uh, 1.6 milliseconds. And then we can even do a little bit better with pomegranate by uh, pre-creating this uh, model object. So instead of initializing a distribution in each case and then computing the probability on it, we first initialize the distribution and then just conti continually, um, and, and we're not counting the time for, uh, uh, for initializing the distribution in this, in this running time. And you can see that's way faster. This is a, uh, about a quarter of the running time of even the normal pomegranate time and an eighth the running time of SciPy. Okay, so why is this so much faster? Um, pomegranate uh, uses caching really aggressively in all its computations. Um, so what I'm showing you here is these are, on the top two equations, are the equations for um, computing the density according to a normal distribution. And the key thing to note here is that it involves this exp function. Uh, so exp is uh, the exponent function, meaning e to the value in here. And it's a pretty expensive function to compute. Um, same thing happens if, you do, if you're computing the log probability. The exp goes away here, but the log comes in here. Same problem with log, it's pretty expensive to compute. Now the trick is, is that if you've already computed uh, this number, log of root two pi times sigma, if you've already computed that, then you can compute the log probability with no logs or um, uh, no logs or exps. Uh, so what's happening in that previous example is that, uh, oh, and I should say that this is, so, and, oh, and the key thing to note is that this, this is constant for a fixed distribution. So if you have already computed this for a given distribution, you only have to compute it once. Uh, so what's happening in that previous example is that pomegranate pre-computed this, uh, and then each time it's trying to do some probability calculation, it doesn't have to recompute it. And I think what's going on with SciPy is it hasn't done that caching, uh, and so it's recomputing. It's computing a log at each loop, so it's it's quite a bit slower. Any questions about this? <clears throat> um, okay, so next uh, I'm going to show you an example. Uh, this is, I think, uh, a, you know, a really important example. It shows how uh, real-world applicable pomegranate is. So here's, here's the field of research. Okay, I'm just kidding. Uh, this, is, this is kind of a fluffy example. This is going to be about the show Gossip Girl. Um, this is going to be an example of uh, kind of how you can apply this in practice. Um, I'm going to say that there, I'm gonna, we're going to take a break after this so you have a chance to take, uh, have a snack, stretch your legs. Um, if you are no fun and you don't want to hear about Gossip Girl, uh, this would uh, be a a good thing to miss. <clears throat> okay, so there's the show Gossip Girl. Um, it's, uh, I think it's about uh, 10 years ago. Oh, another thing is that there's gonna be spoilers for Gossip Girl. So if you don't wanna be spoiled, don't, don't, don't listen. <clears throat> okay, so spoil Gossip Girl is kind of your, um, your typical TV drama. They're a bunch of teenagers in Manhattan. Uh, they take turns hooking up with each other and basically disappointing their parents. <laughs> Uh, so, so what happened is that Jacob uh, and his girlfriend like to watch this show, and of course Jacob, you know, was working on pomegranate at the time, and so he had to apply probabilistic modeling to try to figure out what was going to happen in the show. Okay, so in, in Gossip Girl, there's this eg enigmatic character uh, named Gossip Girl who will send out these text messages to all the characters in the show called blasts, um, just to like stir up trouble. So here's uh, an example of one of these blasts. Spotted, lonely boy. Can't believe the level of his life has returned if only she knew who he was, but everyone knows Serena and everyone is talking. Wonder what Blair Waldorf thinks. Sure, they're BFFs, but we always thought that Blair's boyfriend, Nate, had a thing for Serena. 
okay, you can see just like lots of drama going on in this text message. <clears throat> so, uh, so Jacob's idea was that we want to try to figure out who Gossip Girl is because uh, in the show, we don't know who Gossip Girl is, and there's this assumption that Gossip Girl is probably one of the main characters. So, um, so Jacob's idea was that you can probably figure out uh, who Gossip Girl might be, because Gossip Girl is going to be trying to advance their agenda, uh, you know, probably saying bad things about the other characters and good things about themselves. Um, so uh, here's an example of uh, one of these blasts. Better lock it down, Nate, be uh, clock ticking. So you can see. Uh, Blair lock it down with Nate B. B is one of the characters, I guess, probably Bridget, right? Uh, or Blair, sorry. Uh, so, so this text is sort of in Nate's favor, right? Because it's trying to convince Blair to, you know, what date him or whatever. Uh, and then, and then it's not in Blair's interest because, you know, she's being, um, uh, she doesn't want to date him apparently. <clears throat> okay, so we can do lots of examples. Uh, here's another one. Um, S and B, two characters are stealing from a store, and it's uh, uh, reporting, you know, Gossip Girl is reporting this. So this one is just bad for everyone. It's, it's saying bad things about both these characters. Okay, so, uh, you know, the, these, there are lots of these throughout the show, and, you know, we're gonna try to use some probabilistic modeling to, to solve this. But what if, let's try just not doing any probabilistic modeling, see if we can solve it uh, before. Uh, so here's what we did. If we just take all those pluses and minuses from the different characters and just add them up. Uh, and what you can see here, are the different characters on the top in the show, and it looks like this character has lots of bad things being said about her. Uh, so we can f figure out that she's probably not Gossip Girl, uh, but this, we, we're, we haven't figured out yet because these three characters all have the same sum, so we don't know which one Gossip Girl is. Okay, but uh, we, can do, we can do better with probabilistic modeling. Okay, so the probabilistic modeling we're gonna do is using the beta distribution. This is really important stuff, you guys. D don't, don't fall asleep. <clears throat> okay, so the uh, beta distribution is a way of modeling uh, uncertainty in a, uh, in a probabilistic process. So what a beta distribution imagines is that you have some coin, and you don't know what the probability of the coin coming up heads or tails is, uh, uh, but you've observed some number of coin flips. So what this is showing is the, the horizontal axis is the different possible values for the uh, probability of coin coming up heads, and then the vertical axis is the probability uh, that we think that that's the real weight of the coin. And you can see here's what the probability is for different numbers of observed coin tosses. So if we haven't observed any, well, it's just a uniform distribution over the different values. If we've observed a bunch of heads and tails, and it's an equal number, we can be pretty sure that the coin is roughly a fair coin. If we've observed one heads and two tails, well, we don't really know if it's fair or not. There's a pretty good chance that it's fair, but certainly from our best guess would be that it's unfair and weighted towards uh, tails. Okay, so we're gonna do the same thing for the show. So we're imagining a Gossip Girl is flipping coins, and uh, Gossip Girl is deciding who, or, who to slander or promote uh, you know, based on what they get from the coin. And they have a coin for each character. And of course, Gossip Girl's coin is gonna be you know, more weighted to saying good, t good things towards themselves. <clears throat> okay, so here's what we get from this analysis after season one of the show. Jacob went through. Um, this is a, you know important uh, life-changing thing. Research had to go on hold for this. Uh, he, he went and categorized all the blasts uh, according to who the text slandered, uh, and then and then made a beta distribution for each character. So you can see that, okay, so Jenny is probably, uh, oh, sorry, uh, I think we want, um, we, uh, so uh, being on the right means that you have good things said about you, being on the left means you have bad things said about you. Uh, so here is Jenny, Jenny is having lots of bad things said about her, uh, and Dan is having lots of good things said about her. Uh, him, uh, but but these distributions all overlap, so we can't really tell who's who's who. Or uh, you know, it could be that the red is actually higher than the green. We just don't know yet. And of course, the the person who's gossip girl should be the distribution that's farthest on the right here. Okay, here's what you get 
after you go through the different seasons. Uh, so there are apparently the four seasons total of Gossip Girl. Uh, and here's how these uh, beta distributions evolve uh, as you get more data. So this is, uh, this is the beta distribution after you include all the data from season one and season two. Then here is season one, season two, and season three. Uh, and then uh, all the seasons together. Now, unfortunately, we don't really get a clear answer. Um, Jacob's theory is that it's not that the analysis is bad. It's just that the uh, creators of the show didn't decide who the Gossip Girl and just picked one randomly at the end. Uh, maybe, that's, maybe that's true. Maybe that's not. Maybe they had a plan. But uh, so what our analysis did show, you can see just by a bit, Dan looks like he came out the best in here. Spoiler alert, Dan is Gossip Girl. So. I, that's, that's the answer to the show. And, and we kind of use probabilistic modeling to get it. And you can do this with pomegranate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna take a five minute break, uh, maybe like eight minute break. We're gonna come back at two, uh, take a minute to stretch your legs, uh, have a drink of water. I'll be back at two, 2 p.m. All right, uh, so continuing, continuing on with the talk about pomegranate. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, what I gave you before was the uh, overview of sort of the, the larger features of pomegranate. Now I'm going to go into detail about some of the uh, more complicated and the more powerful features of pomegranate. And the first one is general mixture models. <clears throat> okay, so in many cases in real data, uh, we have the case where it looks like our data is generated not from a single uh, base distribution, but maybe a mixture of those base distributions. So in this case, what it really looks like this data is generated by two Gaussians, uh, one Gaussian distribution here, and one Gaussian distribution here. Um, so uh, we can model this really easily using uh, pomegranate by saying we are going to learn a general mixture model. That's a pomegranate uh, uh, class from samples. Uh, and we are saying that we're going to use uh, two normal distributions, and this is the data we're giving it. And this red line is the distribution that uh, we get. Uh, so it looks pretty good. Um, it, it, it's modeling one hump here, one hump here, matches the data pretty well. Uh, and I'm not showing this here, but it's based on one Gaussian distribution here and one here. Um, and you can see we're using the from samples call. So what from samples is going to do, uh, it turns out in this case, is it first runs k-means, uh, k-means plus plus, I believe, quickly on the data to generate initial, uh, uh, initial and the initialization, and then it runs the em algorithm to iteratively update those uh, Gaussian distributions, and it does that for all mixture models. Um, so that's just a quick way of initializing. It's not. Uh, the optimal way, but it turns out that it's intractable to find what the best optimization or what the best initialization is. Uh, so that that's a pretty good heuristic. Uh, and it can either use k-means plus plus or k-means uh, bar bar. That's the scalable k-means. Uh, there's somewhere that you can set that option. Um, so when people think about when they see the acronym GMM. Uh, they think about a Gaussian mixture model, but actually pomegranate supports general mixture models, mixtures of any types of distributions. Uh, so in this case, you might look at this data and it looks kind of like an exponential distribution maybe, because you know it's high here and low here, that's what the shape of the exponential distribution is. <clears throat> uh, here's what happens when we try to model it with a single exponential distribution. Again, exponential distribution, that's one of the base distributions in pomegranate, and you can see it doesn't look so good. Uh, it's too low at the beginning, and it looks like it's, it tails off too fast uh, in the tail. So, so this, uh, this is not so good. Turns out that you can do a little better uh, by using a mixture of two exponential distributions. So what this is doing is it's uh, using one very steep exponential distribution uh, the, to model this part of the tail, and then one shallow exponential distribution, uh, or uh, the shallow exponential distribution uh, models the tail. Uh, the first one models uh, this, this first part. Um, question. The question is, can you combine different distributions? That's an excellent question. Uh, so the answer is yes, you can. Uh, so here's what you do. You can just take general mixture model, and you can put in a list of different distributions that you'd like. 
Uh, in this case, we're trying to model this using an exponential distribution and a uniform distribution. Uh, that might be a good mixture if you think your data has some signal and then just a bunch of uniform noise. Uh, in this case, it turns out doesn't look so good. But you can imagine a case uh, where, uh, or I mean, you can. This is just supposed to be showing that you can do it, uh, and you can certainly imagine a case where it would do well. Question. Yes, so you have to decide in order to make a mixture model wh uh, what distribution, uh, sorry, question was, do you have to decide what, uh, what distributions you're using? And the answer is yes, you do. Um, you could imagine a strategy where you try like all of the different combinations of distributions and pick the one that gives you the best likelihood. Uh, that's not implemented in pomegranate, but you can imagine doing it. So do you have any, like, any thoughts on intuition of how you would do I have intuition about how you would come up with, with this set of distributions? Uh, it's just your intuition about the data, and maybe from uh, you know, looking at some, some data you've held out for exploratory analysis. Um, so for example, um, in real data, most real data, because of sort of the, the central limit theorem, most data ends up being Gaussian. So it's usually a pretty good bet to model your data using some sort of mixture of Gaussians. Uh, maybe you think your data is generated um, from a Gaussian, but then is exponentiated. Uh, in that case, you might want to use a log normal distribution. That's the example. Or if you think your data is just noisy and there's just some uniform noise, maybe you want to put in uniform. But again, it's just your intuition. You have to understand what the process is that's generating your particular data set. So I noticed you used the graph. You said this looks kind of like two um, Gaussian distributions. It's kind of, you can eyeball that graph. Right. Uh, so the question is, I, I could eyeball this and say, let's look at two distributions. Yeah, it's, it's hard. Uh, I don't have a good answer. It's hard is the answer. Um, I think if we knew, if we could figure this out, maybe machines would have already taken over. So uh, <laughs> good good that, that Pomegranate can't do this. <laughs> OK, any more questions? Do I have examples of higher dimensional data? Um, I think the best example I have for you, let's go back a bunch of slides, is this one. This is a multivariate Gaussian distribution. Um, I don't know the, the, the full set of where pomegranate supports multivariate and where it supports univariate. Does that answer your question? Okay, um, here is some running time. Uh, so this is fitting a multivariate Gaussian um, to components. That's a, that's a feature that scikit-learn also has. But um, it turns out that pomegranate does a bit faster. Um, uh, it turns out that they're implementing the same algorithm. Pomegranate is just doing better caching, so it ends up uh, performing a little faster. So what I'm showing you here is on the vertical axis is how many times faster pomegranate is. You can see that uh, it's never below, excuse me, it's never below one. One is this line here. Uh, so it's pomegranate is doing faster all the time. <clears throat> um, and the, it looks like for fitting, that's the, or sorry, for prediction is the purple, pomegranate is faster and it's a bit faster for fitting. So um, looks good. Questions about general mixture models? <clears throat> OK, so moving on to hidden Markov models. Uh, so a hidden Markov model is a way of defining a probability distribution over a sequence of examples. So um, mixture models come up a lot in my field of research, computational biology, because uh, or specifically in genetics, because you can think of the genome sequence as a big sequence of letters, A, C, T, and G, four letters. <clears throat> um, and you can uh, model that using a hidden Markov model. Hidden Markov models are also coming up in any type of time series data, like, uh, like in finance, uh, also in natural language sometimes, because you can think of uh, words in a sentence as following this, uh, this sequence structure. So what a hidden Markov model does is at each position, you 
uh, you imagine that the hidden Markov model is in some state, uh, and it has certain emission probabilities of what character it can emit based on what state it's in. Um, in this case, just a very simple example, let's imagine we're looking for parts of the genome, uh, that's parts of this, this sequence of DNA letters, uh, that has more C's and G's versus A's and T's. Uh, it turns out in the real human genome, that does occur. Uh, often more functional elements have more C's and G's. Uh, why that is, uh, it's complicated and maybe we don't really know. Um, but, but you might want to look for it using probabilistic modeling. So we can do that using a hidden Markov model. And the way we, we show a hidden Markov model is using this state notation where we can go into two we go between two states. Either we're in an island of CGs, meaning more CGs than we expect, or we're in the background. And we imagine that if we're in a CG island at position I, we have a 90% chance of staying in an island and a 10% chance of switching. And uh, in the background, we have a 90% chance of staying and a 10% chance of switching as well. Uh, and then we imagine we start in uh, one of the two randomly with 50% probability. So hidden markup models are really easy to implement using pomegranate, uh, and it looks like this. So uh, what we're going to do is first we're going to define distributions for the uh, two states we could be in. So D1 is going to be for one state, D2 is going to be for the other. I think D1 is for background. So for background, we have an equal probability of all the four letters. In D2, we have a 40% probability each, an 80% probability total for being in C's and G's, and 20% probability for being in A and T. Uh, then we define states. That's a uh, state for HMM state. Uh, these are all pomegranate classes. Uh, we give it that distribution. It's a, by the way, it's a discrete distribution. That's one of the base distributions that pomegranate supports. And we give it a name, in this case, background and CG island. Then we uh, define a hidden Markov model. It has a name that we call it CG detector. We put in these states, and then we put in all the transitions that we want. So we're going to put, it, have put a tra transition from the start to state one with 50%, start state two, 50%, state one to state one, 90%, two, one to two, 10%, and so on. And then the very last step to making a hidden Markov model is to make this bake to call this bake function that just uh, uh, tells pomegranate that it's time to do all the caching it needs to do before you actually apply it to something. Uh, another thing, by the way, is you can, there's a way to take in as a, a matrix as input rather than doing a bunch of individual function calls. That's just useful. <clears throat> so here are the features of pomegranate compared to another a package for hidden markup models called HMM Learn. HMM Learn is a Python package that's pretty widely used for hidden markup models. You can see there's a check mark where Pomegranate has a feature and a check mark where HMM Learn has a feature. This is something that was a table that was uh, developed by HMM Learn, so we didn't, we didn't make this. Um, and you can see there's some cases where HMM Learn has some features we don't have. Um, Pomegranate doesn't have priors yet, for example. Um, but there's a bunch of cases where we have features that HMM Learn doesn't have. Um, the most useful ones are probably these uh, graph structure or modeling features. So these are cases where if you think your data, for example, has silent states, meaning a state that uh, doesn't produce any output, you can model that using Pomegranate but not using HMM Learn. And there's a bunch of examples of that. Um, so of course, if, if you thought your data was distributed that way, uh, you you just be out of luck with HMM Learn. Question. Um, when you say you don't have priors, when you specify the discrete distribution, are there not priors? I don't actually know what priors is corresponding to. Uh, the question is, is isn't this a prior? These the start transitions, and I think they're using priors to mean something else, uh, and I'm not exactly sure. So you'll have to look at this table. There's probably like some a caption that says exactly what they mean which one is. Sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. Any more questions? <clears throat> okay, um, now we can, we can show an example of this stacking by, we're gonna stack three things on top of each other. We're going to make a hidden Markov model where the emission distribution is a mixture model 
and that mixture model is of normal distributions. Okay, so this is really showing uh, how that stacking functionality is really useful. So in this case, before we had that discrete distribution as our emission distribution here, uh, in this case, we just replaced that line with a general mixture model, uh, and this is just some mixture that we're, we're defining the parameters of. So this, so now this would be a hidden Markov model over real numbers. So I don't know why you necessarily want to do this, but you can certainly imagine a case where you would. And the code here, it's exactly the same except for these two lines. So just a very simple switch. Uh, and this is a speed comparison between pomegranate and HMMLearn. Uh, again, pomegranate is quite a bit faster. Um, so again, the axis is the number of times that pomegranate is faster. And you can see one is like down here. So uh, pomegranate is always faster. There's no points uh, below one. Whoa. <clears throat> uh, and so the most important line is probably the training time, because that's usually the most expensive part of a hidden Markov model, and you can see that pomegranate is quite a bit faster, and it gets, and the degree to which it's faster increases as the size of the problem grows. Uh, I believe the a horizontal axis is the number of uh, components of that um, uh, the the hidden Markov model. Uh, questions about hidden Markov models? Okay. Uh, so we're going to go on to uh, Bayes nets, uh, Bayesian networks. So a Bayesian network is just a way to define a multivariate distribution, uh, meaning a distribution over a bunch of different variables. Now, uh, a Bayesian network has the particular structure that it says that some uh, that an arrow in this graph structure means that this. Uh, variable is conditionally dependent on this variable. So sprinkler is conditionally dependent on rain. Uh, just to make this concrete, uh, this is a, a pretty simple probabilistic example. Um, it could either be raining or it could not be raining. Uh, there, you could turn on the sprinkler, and whether you turn it on depends on whether it's rain, be, raining, because if there's, it's already raining, you're probably not going to turn on the sprinkler. And then whether or not the grass is wet depends on whether well, the grass is wet if either the sprinkler turned on or the rain rain happens. Okay, so uh, so you can see in this particular example that sprinkler depends just on rain. Of course, whether or not you turn on the sprinkler uh, doesn't depend on grass, of course, because that sprinkler is defining whether or not grass is uh, wet. And then nothing is determining whether or not rain falls. That's just random. And then again, grass depends on both of these, uh, you know, whether or not both of these happened. Um, so uh, these edges indicate conditional dependence. And the really important thing is that uh, if there's no edge, it means there's conditional independence. So if you know whether or not rain occurred, uh, you can figure out what the full probability distribution is for sprinkler. And you don't need to know if the grass is wet. Um, now, it turns out that this structure makes uh, inference uh, really uh, efficient in some cases. Um, uh, because the inference algorithms can take advantage of this uh, graph structure. You can sometimes compute probabilities of over one part of the graph without having to consider all of the different possibilities for another part of the graph. Um, so I'm not going to talk in detail about those inference algorithms, but they're implemented by pomegranate. And it means that for some uh, structures of models, uh, using those algorithms is going to be much, much, much faster than thinking about it as just a general multivariate distribution. Uh, Bayes nets are also really valuable because they're very interpretable. Um, you, can, you can look at you know, the structure of variables, and it usually makes sense intuitively. And you can also look at each uh, conditional dependence, and you can see exactly how one variable depends on all the others. Um, so there are two tasks you might want to perform in uh, a Bayes net. The first is inference in that network. And the second is learning what the dependency structure is. Um, so very quickly, I'm going to show you an example of, or uh, let me just very quickly explain uh, a rough example of how Bayes net inference works. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, uh, you can Google the uh, belief propagation algorithm. That's the algorithm that 
pomegranate implements. So what happens is that basically uh, there's information, there's like a message passing algorithm where uh, there are different what are called factors that, that have information about different sets of variables and you pass information from factors to marginal distributions over each variable. Um, and basically by passing messages, you can uh, com compute things about this network without having to uh, perform computations over the entire network at once. Okay, let's look at a toy example for how this works. Um, so I'm showing you here a toy medical diagnostic network. Um, so what I'm showing you here is on the top are different genetic mutations you could have. So these are just names of different genes. Uh, in the middle are different conditions you could have. This is ovarian cancer, uh, lactose intolerance, and pregnancy. And then at the bottom are different symptoms you could have. Low energy, bloating, loss of appetite, vomiting, and abdominal cramps. Okay, so, so uh, a great way that you can use this probabilistic model is maybe you have observed some, uh, actually before I go into that, uh, here's just the probabilities you get without any information. And you can see that the probability of any of these things happening is pretty low. Again, this is completely toy, like all these numbers are made up, but they're maybe kind of realistic, who knows. Um, so here's what happens if you've observed some of these values. So in this case, we, we find a person who has low energy, they have bloating, and they have vomiting. Um, and then we don't know anything about any of the other variables. So what happens if we set these to be true in the model and then just ask what's the probability of all these other things that we don't know? So here's how those probabilities update. You can see that the probability for uh, low energy bloating and vomiting is one, obviously, because we define that. And then you can see some interesting things like the probability of ovarian cancer was really low before and it goes up to 90%. So maybe that's Maybe we can diagnose someone with, with ovarian cancer using this model. Uh, and then some other interesting things, like you don't know if the person has lost an appetite, but just because it looks like they probably have ovarian cancer, and if you have ovarian cancer, you usually have loss of appetite, uh, the model already knows that that person probably doesn't have an appetite. So this is, of course, a very toy example, but uh, models like this are used uh, in practice very successfully. Um, and I, there are some cases where um, diagnosis is actually, th this type of Bayesian network is actually a key part of diagnosis. Any questions about Bayes net inference? And again, uh, just to point out, this is it's very easy to, to form these things in, in pomegranate. All we had to do is we defined the whole model, the whole structure, and then we just did predict the probability of uh, in a given state, yes? The question is, can the, uh, the software handle if there are loops in the Bayesian network? So by definition, something uh, isn't a Bayesian network if it has uh, loops in it. Um, a loop, and if you think about from a, like a sort of causal standpoint, there can never be a causal loop, right? You can never have one thing causes something else which actually caused it in the first place. You can have a loop in time, meaning something at time, at the first time step, caused it later in time, and then the other thing caused it backwards, uh, you know, again in, in, in time and the other, uh, you know, again later in time, but, but never at the same time step. So how those causal loops are handled, you in practice usually is defining uh, variables for each time step, and then, and then you get rid of the causal loops. Um, there is a, another, case uh, or uh, another aspect to this which you might be asking about which is that not directed loops in this graph but if you have cases where um, there there's a lot of entanglement between all your different uh, variables and there's a particular uh, definition called a tree width which you can define exactly how entangled they are but if the graph is very entangled then you can't exploit that independence uh, and get fast inference um, there are a couple of different solutions for that. Um, 
One is called, is an approximation method called loopy belief propagation. So pomegranate impl implements belief propagation, which is the exact method. It also inf implements loopy belief propagation, uh, which does much faster in that specific case where there's a lot of entanglement. There are other, excuse me, there are other approximation methods that uh, also can handle that. Pomegranate implements just loopy belief propagation. Does that answer your question? Okay. <clears throat> Any more questions? Okay, so the second question in Bayesian networks is trying to learn the structure of a given Bayes net. So we just have a bunch of variables. Uh, again, this could be things related to diagnosis, for example, you know, uh, different uh, medical conditions, different genetic conditions, uh, genetic mutations rather, different symptoms, and you just want to know what causes what. This is a much harder problem than just performing inference. There are three uh, general ways to do this. One is called search and score. Uh, I should say there are three categories of methods. Um, search and score is an exact strategy. Constraint learning, uh, I'm not going to go into uh, detail, but it's something you can Google uh, if you're interested. And then just heuristics um, that aren't exact and don't have any guarantees, but uh, tend to perform well in practice. So pomegranate supports uh, methods in these two categories. So I'm going to talk about those. <clears throat> so uh, suppose you're going to try to do exact structure inference. Uh, here's how the running time grows. Um, so in this case, we just uh, created some toy data and asked pomegranate to find the causal structure uh, exactly using the naive search and score method. So here's how the running time grows. You can see it grows pretty fast. And actually, this is a log scale plot. So this is growing. So a straight line in this plot means exponential increase in running time. This grows faster than linear, so it's actually super exponential. So that's pretty bad. Uh, now, it turns out you can do a little bit better. Um, th uh, this green line is a, a strategy that is a little bit better than this naive method. But pretty recently, a dynamic programming method was developed that does a little bit better. And this dynamic programming method uh, performs in exponential running time. Um, so this is the first time I've ever seen someone advertise their method as exponential running time. That was a good thing. But here you go. Better than super exponential. In this case, super is bad. OK, but uh, we, can, we can do a little better, or we can do faster, uh, worse performance but faster running time uh, using some approximations. The first one I'm going to tell you about is called the Chow Liu algorithm and, and the tree uh, with the same name. So what a uh, Chow Liu tree, uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce this name, uh, does is it assumes that each variable just has one parent. So that's a pretty strong assumption because in most cases of real data, uh, you don't imagine that everything is just dependent on one other thing. There's, that assumes that there's no interaction between any of your, your different examples. But you can do it, and it's fast. So that's good. Uh, so you can see here's how the running time grows as you add a number more variables. And in this case, the running time is much more reasonable. And it's a line would be exponential, and this is under a line. Uh, so that's less than exponential. Turns out it's a quadratic algorithm. Uh, it grows according to the number of variables squared. Um, now, there are a couple other of these heuristics. And pomegranate supports four of them. So what I'm showing you is two plots. On the left is the running time. Uh, and higher, so higher is worse uh, in this plot. And on the right, I'm showing you the uh, ultimate probability of the data given the model. Uh, so higher is better on this plot. So you can see a couple of different methods. There's two exact methods, um, this teal exact method and the purple exact method. This uh, purple one is based on an algorithm called A star. Um, a star is a uh, graph search heuristic. You see they, the running time of these two is pretty high, but the performance is pretty high too. The, the two lines are above each other, the purple line and the teal line, uh, because they're both exact methods, uh, and they're both the best performing. Uh, that Chow Lu algorithm I showed you, very fast. You can see it's right down here on the bottom of all the methods but it's also on the bottom in terms of performance. Um, there's another method that I'm going to tell you about uh, in a second 
uh, this based on a greedy method. This, me this was um, developed in part by Jacob. Uh, is sort of in the middle. It looks like the running time not too bad, and the performance is just a little bit worse than exact. So what's that greedy algorithm that, uh, that looks like it's doing pretty well? So this greedy algorithm is based on this idea of a constraint graph. Um, so in, this algorithm doesn't apply if you have no information at all about your variables, but it works in the case where you have some prior knowledge where you know that some set of your variables might have influence on some other set. So let's go back to that example of uh, diagnosis. We know that symptoms are based on conditions, meaning uh, diseases or whatever, um, and that conditions are based on genetic mutations. So genetic mutations certainly can't depend on conditions in most cases, right? Because you know you have your genetics is what you've had from birth, so that doesn't depend on anything. Um, and then symptoms are defined just on the genetic conditions you have, or sorry, the the medical conditions you have, not on not directly on your genetics. So we can use this. Uh, structure to constrain our, uh, our what causal structure that we can have in our model. And we can actually perform this, uh, uh, we can find the structure of our model a lot faster using these constraints. Uh, now you can say, now by the way, this is, this is purely a generalization of the general problem. The general problem is you just take all of your variables and you put them in one of these groups of variables and you put a self loop. So that's saying that any variable can influence any other variable. But of course, if you do that, it's not any, any faster. So here's how we do um, comparing the exact running time to that constrained running time. And you can see the constrained is much faster. Um, and that's just because instead of having to search over all of the possible configurations, it has to search over just configurations uh, that follow the structure, and that eliminates a lot of configurations. Uh, another nice thing about this is that this lends itself well to parallelization, because if uh, we can, it turns out that we can do some of the computation in this leg of the model and in this leg of the model without having, without those parts having to talk to each other at all. Um, so we can do this part in one core, this part in another core, and have a running time. OK, so let's, let's do a slightly more complicated example. Um, so Jacob you know, did this work and decided the next thing to do was try to make money on the stock market. Uh, so, so here's what he tried to do. He tried to take um, all of the uh, top 20 uh, stocks in the in some stock exchange, this is you don't don't try this. You're not going to make money off of it. And <laughs> Jacob didn't try either, so, so don't worry. Um, and and binarize them as either being uh, higher than its last opening or lower. And uh, so and you can see how we have that idea of a time scale where, for a particular stock, it can it can influence um, itself in the future or other stocks in the future, uh, but it can't influence, you know, it can't, there's no influence that goes backwards in time. Um, so that's how you deal with that idea of there being no causal loops. Um, so we tried doing the structure inference on, on this, uh, and you know, it made the results. Who knows if it's good? So let's see. Um, if you look over here, VED, that turns out to be a mining company, VZ, is Verizon. So first thing, the mining company doesn't depend on anything, whether or not it goes up or down. Uh, maybe that's because it just depends on um, you know, mineral prices or whatever. So that doesn't depend on anything. Verizon depends on the mining company. OK, I don't, I don't know if I buy that. But anyway, you, you, can, you can look at this and try to, make, you can try to decide if it makes sense to you. Uh, presumably, if you did this a little bit better, you might be able to get some real results. But neither of us are finance people, so we don't know. Uh, okay, this paper, by the way, on this method is coming out. It's coming out in a um, journal called PureJ. So I believe it should be coming online today, actually. So 
Google if you're interested. Any questions about base nets? <coughs> Question? Yeah. OK, so the next topic is going to be Bayes classifiers. So this is using uh, these probabilistic methods for supervised learning. So supervised learning is the case where you're trying to, again, distinguish multiple classes of things, for example, spam from not spam. So what a Bayes classifier does is it imagines that you have uh, different models that your data could come from, and you're trying to predict uh, which model it came from. So in this case, you have uh, one probability distribution over emails that spammers could send, another probability distribution over emails that normal people send, and then you look at a given email and try to guess uh, which is more likely that it came from. Uh, so in this case, we have probability of the model that the data is derived from given the data. And we can compute this using Bayes' rule by asking, uh, so what's the probability of a given model? We can ask, what's the probability of the data given that model times the probability of the data, or sorry, probability of the model, the prior distribution, uh, divided by a normalization constant. So it looks like this, the likelihood times the prior divided by normalization. So normalization is just there so that your posterior distribution adds up to one. Uh, so the important part is defining a likelihood distribution and a prior distribution uh, for your data and your model, respectively. So let's look at an example. Here's some data. Um, it's, in this case, it's classified. So the purple examples came from one class. The teal examples came from the other class. And it looks like you should be able to distinguish between these two pretty well, because it looks like everything above here or so is probably teal, and below is probably purple. That's a pretty good classifier. Um, so here's how what we get if we just try to fit two uh, distributions on these two sets. Um, uh, in this case, we're going to fit Gaussian distributions. So this looks pretty good. Uh, you know, the teal distributions on the right, the purple is on the, on the left. But the problem is, but this, if you, if you add up these two distributions, they don't look the same. So why is that? Well, it's because we forgot to include a prior distribution. Because it looks like in our original data that less examples are coming from purple than are coming from teal. So what we want to do is we want to learn a prior probability um, of, I guess, magenta and cyan. Um, the prior probability of magenta is less than the prior probability of cyan. So in order to use our classifier, we need to incorporate both. Now, here's what happens if we uh, scale those two distributions according to their prior probability. And this looks much better. This looks like it matched the data that we uh, saw before. Um, and, and if you use the Bayes classifier, the Bayes classifier will give you a very high probability. If you see a value here, it'll give you a very high probability of teal because it adds up the teal and the uh, the magenta and divides by the total. So it's much more teal than there is purple here. Magenta, sorry. Um, over here, it's going to give you a high probability of magenta because it's mostly magenta. Uh, here, it's going to be about 50-50 um, because it's hard to tell which distribution it came from. Um, there's another variant of, uh, of a Bayes classifier called Naive Bayes. So the Naive Bayes is pretty similar, except that instead of having a probability distribution over all the data together, it assumes that each, uh, each variable in your data, so if you have, if this is a multivariate uh, distribution, for example, if you have um, uh, multiple pieces of information about each example, in the case of spam, you might have uh, multiple different words you're measuring. You probably have multiple different words you're measuring. Uh, so what Naive Bayes does is it says that each of those things is independent, so we can just multiply them together. This notation means you take, uh, all, for all the different values of i, you take, you put an i here, and then you multiply them all together. This guy times this guy times this guy. Uh, and then again, same normalization at the bottom. Um, so here's an example when you run Naive Bayes uh, on just two dimensions. So what I'm showing you here is each dot is a data example. It's colored by its class. Uh, again, either magenta or cyan. And the two pieces of information you have about the data is the vertical and horizontal axes, horizontal and vertical. Uh, and then what 
the, what pomegranate did is it fit two, it fit one Gaussian distribution for cyan, that's like kind of centered here, and one for magenta, it's centered here. It looks like magenta is more clustered, <clears throat> so it has a smaller variance. And then here, this black line is the decision boundary. So that's everything inside the black circle uh, will get classified as magenta from the final classifier, and everything outside is cyan. And you can kind of see why that is. Um, cyan uh, has a higher variance, so you can, if you imagine there's a point just way off in the weeds, uh, it's more likely that the higher variance distribution uh, produced that. So like even here, like maybe it's more likely cyan. You can decide whether or not it's a good classifier or not and change your distribution, but this is what you get. And it's a circle because of naive Bayes because it's a, uh, it couldn't, it, it would in general be an ellipse, but because it's naive Bayes, it's always a circle, uh, you know, with equal proportions on each side. Um, you can do this again for things like a hidden Markov model. Here's where we defined um, a naive Bayes over the sequence. And uh, uh, you can see, you, you, if you run uh, pomegranate uh, using hidden Markov model with uh, cyan and uh, magenta um, classes, uh, here's what pomegranate predicts different classes to be. And you can also extract after you've run pomegranate to see uh, what the distribution that pomegranate thinks uh, are each class has. So you can see it looks like uh, magenta has, in general, a higher mean and cyan a lower mean. Not quite sure what's going on over here. The question is, uh, the hidden Markov model is generating this data. So I believe what Jacob did is he used a hidden Markov model to generate the data and then forgot about the original data and then tried to figure out what the hidden Markov model would be just from the data. So in, in real case, you would not have, you would just have the data and a couple of labeled examples. More questions? Um, okay, so uh, just another you know, example is that, um, uh, is that you can apply lots of different, that, that you can use whatever distribution you like to put into a Bayes classifier. Could be a normal distribution like we've seen, it could be an exponential distribution, or it could be one of these uh, weird distributions that we were talking about, a mixture model, a hidden Markov model, a Bayes net, anything like that. You can define a Bayes classifier over any of those examples. Uh, now, just to show you how uh, using a good distribution can help you uh, do a good job. So in this case, we have uh, some data. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not showing you what it is, but it's, there's some training data and some training labels, and then some test data and some test labels. Um, and what we're looking at is we're comparing naive Bayes run by uh, pomegranate naive Bayes from scikit-learn, which I think for these, in the very simple Gaussian case, uh, it, there is, scikit-learn does implement naive Bayes. And then pomegranate, where we use some more exotic um, distribution. I think it's a mixture of these three distributions that we're uh, defining naive Bayes on. And then what you can see is that um, Pomegranate and scikit-learn do exactly the same. That makes sense because they're implementing the exact same algorithm. And then this heterogeneous uh, naive Bayes strategy that that lets you know that has much more flexible modeling uh, does better. So this is showing you how having that power and that flexibility uh, can, in very in many cases, give you better performance. Do you know that's not overfitting in that case? Uh, the question is: Is it overfitting? Um, well, we're, we're doing this on a test set. So we're not strictly, over, we're not training on the test data. You could imagine that maybe Jacob like looked through a whole bunch of different distributions that kept testing on the test data. So you would want to have a separate validation set. This is just a toy example. So I think, uh, I don't know how it was, but it's, uh, but, in, but in general, it turns out on real data, having the flexibility does, and is often found to help. 
Um, so you might worry that having a lot of flexibility hurts you in terms of running time. Turns out it doesn't. Um, here is uh, where scikit-learn does implement um, this naive Bayes algorithm. So again, this is just in the Gaussian case because we scikit-learn doesn't in, implement any of the other cases, so we can't compare against it. But for that case, uh, scikit-learn and pomegranate have the same running time. So you're not losing even in running time by doing pomegranate. Now, just a reminder before we get too far down the naive Bayes route is that we don't need to have independence, uh, meaning we don't have to use naive Bayes. We can still use a uh, normal Bayes classifier without that naive assumption. It's a little bit slower, but uh, it still works. So in this case, um, uh, there's two, two possibilities. On the left is either the naive Bayes, uh, it's uh, a two Gaussian distributions, and a non-naive normal base classifier on the right. And what you can see is the decision boundary here, that, that black line is kind of weird. Like you, it looks like the teal data is sort of crossing the decision boundary. You should be able to get these guys. It looks like you want a different decision boundary. Uh, and with the normal base classifier, non-naive, uh, it doesn't have to assume independence between these two axes, and so it can get a much better boundary. You can see it gets a lot more points correct than this one. It kind of misses some. Now, again, just to show you the value of this flexibility, <clears throat> um, here's what happens if we define a Bayes classifier using a Gaussian mixture model. So here's some data. It looks like you might see this and look like it comes from, each class comes from mixtures. Um, in, uh, the, if you try to model, do a, a base classifier with just one Gaussian for each, you get kind of weird decision boundaries, as you expect. On the right is what we get if we do a base classifier using two uh, Gaussian components. And you can see it's a much better model of the data, and you get a much more complex decision boundary. Um, so uh, this is good, and this, is show, this shows how valuable it is to be able to, again, uh, have all that flexibility for defining your, uh, the models, being able to put one model into another. Um, and just to show you how easy this is, um, here's all the code to do the plot on the last page. You just define one general mixture model for uh, one data set, another general mixture model from the other data set, and define your base classifier uh, based on the two. That's it. <clears throat> Then just, to, I'm not going to show you uh, data for this, but here's what, how you create Bayes classifiers for a bunch of different categories of model. You can create Bayes classifiers over hidden Markov models, meaning you have uh, a sequence and you're trying to determine which hidden Markov model that sequence is generated from. Just three lines of pomegranate, you know, more to define the hidden Markov model, but once you have the hidden Markov model, uh, it's just three lines to define the Bayes classifier. Same thing for base nets. OK, in the last few minutes, I want to just show you kind of a finale where we take sort of all the features and a pomegranate and put them uh, together. So we're going to train a mixture model over hidden Markov models in parallel. Um, so again, uh, creating a mixture model of hidden Markov models is really simple. Uh, so wh what is a mixture model of hidden Markov models? You could imagine there's some process that um, you, your output is a sequence, and what the process does, at first it flips a coin to decide which hidden Markov model it's going to use, and then depending on which hidden Markov model it uses, it runs that hidden Markov model and generates your data. So now you've just seen the data, and you're trying to, to um, you know, define a model that captures that mixture of hidden Markov model data. And you can see using pomegranate, it's really easy to do this. Uh, you just create your hidden Markov models, and then your mixture model, mixture model can just take hidden Markov models as input. So uh, here's your model. You just put uh, three HMMs as the argument. Um, now to show you that this is parallelizable. So a mixture model in general is pretty easy, easy to parallelize because uh, you can do your inference on each uh, each mixture component separately. 
So this is what I'm showing you what happens when you add more threads, uh, and you have cores to support these threads, of course, um, in order to train this mixture of three hidden markup models. Uh, so you can see that you get a lot of speed up for the first, once you get three cores, once you get more than three cores, you don't get much speed up. Um, but uh, that parallelization is doing you uh, a great job. You're getting down uh, almost a factor of three at this point from the running time on just one core. Um, so I, I'm not sure exactly when you'd want to do a mixture of hidden Markov models, but this is just showing you how flexible this idea of model stacking and how uh, pomegranate uh, can figure out how to parallelize even this weird, wonky mixture of hidden Markov models method. <clears throat> um, so that concludes the tutorial on pomegranate. Um, documentation on pomegranate is available on Read the Docs. So just Google pomegranate Read the Docs and you'll find the documentation. Uh, tutorials, uh, IPython Notebook. Uh, one of these, this one here, is the one I linked you to, but there's a bunch more Python Notebook tutorials. Uh, I just want to put up some acknowledgments. Uh, oops. Da, 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 da. Um, some acknowledgments, these are the um, organizations that supported Jacob in uh, producing pomegranate. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you for your attention. Question. So how robust is this system and package at this point? Is it production quality at this point, or how would you characterize how many people are using it, or talk a little bit about the package and its adoption rate and all that good stuff? Yes, yeah, so the question is, how robust is this package? How well, how widely adopted is it? Um, how many people are using it right now? You should ask Jacob for more specifics. I would characterize it, my best guess is sort of mid-stage of adoption. It's well past sort of the initial, um, you know, just getting off the ground stage. It's not quite the stage where like millions of people are using it. I mean, this is programming. Maybe thousands of people are using it. Um, I believe it's on the order of maybe hundreds of people using it. A couple of big companies, I believe, are using it. Um, so it's pretty, pretty well adopted. Uh, question. Uh, what in the heterogeneous Bayes classifier? Uh, what were those defined? Um, I don't know the answer. I actually I noticed that this afternoon I emailed Jacob and I didn't hear from him. So e email Jacob to get the answer to that. Question over here. Hey, uh, I was just wondering: Is this package still under active development? Are they looking for more contributors to the package? Are they looking for more contributors? I believe the answer is yes. Um, message Jacob if you're interested in contributing. I think that would be super helpful. Question. So when I tried to kind of install it, it was 2.7 only. Is there a Python 3 version that works? Yeah, there's a Python 3 version. Well, that's just your Python 3. Okay, I like Python 2.7. Yeah, it's a Python. Question is what versions are available? It sounds like 2.7, 3.5, and 3.6 are all available. Question. Do you know if any big projects are using it, like open source projects that are using Pomegranate? Open, so the question is, are there open source projects using Pomegranate? I don't know the answer to that. Question. Uh, are conditional random, uh, random fields supported? Um, there is a package for um, Markov chains, which may or may not be uh, random fields. I am not sure. You should ask Jacob. It's a pretty simple uh, addition for to go from Bayes nets to Markov random fields. So I would imagine he probably has, but I don't know the answer. All right, uh, if there are no questions, thanks everyone for your attention. All right, thanks again, Max, it was a great talk.